It is Sunday, May the 19th, 2024. Um, for some people, it is considered Pentecost or the recognition of Pentecost. And I want to share with you some um, information today because I am tired of waking up in pain, with joint pain and all of that. And I was um, scrolling through my YouTube and in my Facebook and, you know, I want people to understand that I'm willing to show them the life around me in its rawest form because we are at war. My family is at war. And so, you know, you see these influencers or people who are wannabe influencers who rob content for no discernible, productive reason. And you watch that. But I want you to understand that um, this is the situation. This is what's happening in real life. And when the ish hits the fan and starts to roll down on top of the people who, you know, feel anxious about exposing themselves to it because they don't want to know the truth because then they'd be forced to make decisions about how they have contributed to it and how the work that they do colludes in this whole process that's been going on around my home and around my city and around my region. I don't care. And I, I'm telling you right now, I will be merciless because you cannot give mercy to people who have handled you mercilessly. I think people may be confused about what the experience was like for the quote unquote apostles on the day of Pentecost when that fire hit them. Let me help you to know right now. The first thing that I'm going to show you is Virginia natural gas coming onto our property and marking directly under my window which will set a radius around what they have, what the United States Army Corps of Engineers have been doing around us for the last two to three years. You can be in fear if you want to, but you need to be in fear of the right thing for the right reason. Good afternoon, it is Saturday, September the 23rd, and I came out here um, after the storm that we had last night and was grateful to see that my little display, despite how the wind blew down some limbs and stuff, is like, is like untouched. And um, to, because when I came out, I noticed these markings. And so, because I noticed these markings, I thought it would be a good idea to come out and tell this story while I video because they're new and I you know I don't know what it means that it's, you know, now with some more new markings. There's the old one from the gas thing, and then here's this new one. But anyway, I was having a conversation on the Vine this morning about um, the history uh, in the context of everything that I posted today. And the, uh, the history of family men buying their families out of slavery. And it's significant because of this narrative that um, natives owned slaves when natives did not own slaves but if slaves were allowed to buy their families out of slavery then it would have to be documented it also illuminated the fact that if slaves were allowed to buy their families out of slavery then that means on some level even slaves 
uh, property ownership had to be acknowledged as a legal um, issue that could be disputed. every year they dig up parts of the, the road and install something or move something um, but this is the most extensive work uh, I've seen since they started doing this uh, in I, I don't know I guess 2019 2020 somewhere around there they, no 2018 when they were doing the um, the River Star Home uh, Flood Prevention Project, which was a total sham but I, I just wanted to capture all of this because I, I'll put it together with um, some information on Amazon uh, cloud computing The slaves uh, property ownership had to be acknowledged as a legal um, issue that could be disputed and that's significant it, it kind of changes the way you think about history as it relates to slavery in the United States but I suspect that because the deal was with between uh, the British and British Africans um, and then later British Indians from East India that when they were here to overtake an area by assimilating because they looked like the natives um, they had to let some of the slaves um, buy their families out of slavery so that they had an excuse for why uh, the Africans had slaves but they of course they weren't calling themselves Africans and so I just
side to what property owners or renters can do, I'll follow up in the rear and kind of talk about how we respond with the hand that we're dealt uh, to the recurring flooding, to when, when we see a Hurricane Matthew or what Hurricane Florence could have been, significant flooding events, what tools are available to us that we can share with you, those tools that you can monitor, how we can alert each other when there's uh, an issue of flooding and unmet needs, and otherwise just be able to rebound from that incident and, and get us back to our normal uh, and otherwise strive forward as a, as a locality. So now there was a small piece of what Norfolk was, and the rest of it was marshland, right? Trivia question, anyone know what happened in Norfolk in 1855? Well, Willoughby, uh, Willoughby actually developed in the 1700s. It was the yellow fever epidemic where thousands were killed. So usually when there's a pandemic, a public health pandemic, how is that disease spread usually? Mosquitoes. And where do mosquitoes thrive? In marshland. So let's be clear. This is what it looks like when you expect other people or even just one person to clean up the mess you made. So all that to say there are reasons why I mean obviously a lot of it is economic but there's also some public health some mitigation measures that were taken back then by filling in some of that marshland really good reasons uh, but that also helped contribute to where we are today. Let's look at what did Hurricane Florence do to North Carolina? It, it devastated it, right? What about Hurricanes Harvey and, and the storms out in, in uh, well, Florida and Texas and other areas with devastating flooding? We have to rebuild, right? There are areas that have to rebuild. And that's really where it's important to have a, a vision. And not only a vision, but one that was informed by the community. I know the work that they've done in the Resilience Office, uh, Public Works, Planning, it's all been community, uh, community driven, trying to get the, the input uh, and the advice from, from those in our community. And that's why these meetings are so important. So if we did have to rebuild certain areas, we're not gonna do it from scratch. We're not gonna try to, try to think of something and, and wing it. It's gonna be grounded in these types of documents, the Vision 2100, our hazard mitigation plan, our resilience strategy, all of those play a significant role in that starting point in rebuilding if we were to be uh, experiencing devastation from a storm. Um, you may be experiencing uh, and funding from outside agencies and our ability to write grants, our ability to solicit and work with our, our federal delegation uh, to again try to bring those resources into the area and those areas that are addressed first have to be prioritized based on a matrix uh, not so much on on how uh, you know the the uh, how many folks live in a particular area but other uh, things like and, and the mayor alexander mentioned during a previous council meeting you know the public safety piece the economic piece there's so many things so many criteria that needs to go into a matrix to where it can again be data driven and we can let you know for sure we might be able to address your issues by this date and time or later down this road so that's our commitment and again there are things that you're able to do right now as a property owner or renter and i'd and i was trying to figure out how i would like to navigate this day It's coming July 31st. How bad do you want it? Connecting the dots. Right here at Gethsemane. For all the residents of Ward 4. Jim Reddick, Emergency Preparedness and Response, and I'm the director. Well, I think city employees should all know that everyone is essential. Everyone has a role to play in response to any disaster, uh, hurricanes being one of the ones that we see on a regular basis. So whether their duties are needed at the time of the storm or soon thereafter, everyone really has a role to play. So we're looking at folks who are shelter teams that will be on standby and ultimately deployed uh, and making sure that, that our residents and our visitors and our businesses have a place to go to be safe uh, from the conditions. So leading up to a hurricane, we have public works, public utilities, general services, parks and recreation doing what they do 
to prepare for the storm. We know that we're going to get flooding, uh, and so they're going around doing what they can to make sure that they, they're taking care of the equipment. Isn't a no-notice event. We usually see it working its way across the Atlantic, and so it being slow moving, we have times to take steps to prepare. And so it's making sure that one, your, your family and your home is, is set and, and good to go. Because if your services are needed leading up to or immediately after the storm, we need you to be, to be able to be focused on, on the mission. To find out what evacuation zone you're in, you can go to knowyourzoneva.org and type in your address. I want you to now ask yourself, who is your enemy and who do you trust to protect you? This is a city council work session from January 2019. I've been sending you all updates about every other day or so of what's going on, but what you have at your place that you can run through is sort of a, we've gone through each department of how we think we could conceivably be impacted depending on how long things lasted. The, <clears throat> the short answer is we don't expect any major impacts. Um, unless this thing continues for another month or longer, but literally the back of that page tells you what we think those impacts could conceivably be. So know that uh, Morgan Whalen and Holland and Knight are tracking this stuff pretty closely. We're tracking it by department really closely, and if uh, we may have a much longer report for you on the 29th, this would go uh, that long. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, I, I, Doug, I think it's important that while it, this is really thorough and very helpful, and I appreciate it looks at city's perspective and our operations, how we'll be affected. But I worry with so many um, federal military workers in the city of Norfolk, have we done any analysis on what their needs are and how that might impact our services? I mean, just... Um, not not to, not to any level. We're in a little bit of uncharted waters, but so, so not to a, a detailed level. The Catherine's jumping DOD up. The is one of the groups, the offices that are still open and funded through the end of the federal fiscal year. So there shouldn't be any local military aspects unless their spouse works for a, for one of the agencies or us or somebody who's relying on federal funds on a pass-through. But in the short run, it's really going to hinge on how long this lasts. We'll smile and we'll start. All right, Mr. Manager. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good to see everybody this evening. Um, I'm going to run you through the agenda, and then we'll get started. So we've got a, a couple of items that are on your agenda tonight that I think it's just always good to sort of hear about and get an overview. And, uh, Bobby Tahan is going to stand up and talk to you about a, a zoning text amendment that's actually on your agenda for the uh, for the 20th. And then items uh, R4 and R5 are a couple of VDOT projects that you all uh, advanced last October. But again, I think it's good for you to, to hear what's happening there. And uh, Richard Broad will jump up and, and tell you what's happening there. And then I'm pleased to have Dr. Joel English uh, with uh, Centura College, and I think everybody knows, but uh, really a, a, a great story of collaboration, partnership, and growth in Norfolk. And we talk a lot about um, inclusive economic development, and, uh, and much of that is about talent development. And nobody's doing any more than uh, Dr. English and his team. And, and you all know that they've acquired the uh, Cavalry School in Willow Creek Road and have great plans for that. And that's coming up on your agenda here shortly uh, 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 later in the month. And so I want you all to have a chance to, to hear about that. Um, sorry, Ms. Johnson and um, Ms. Graves are not here, but uh, they're aware that y'all's policy says we want to talk to you. We want to share it to, with you before you vote on it, so we really didn't want to wait uh, until um, your next meeting. And then, uh, we, you know, we, we've talked, uh, your last several work sessions have really been about um, looking at regional um, issues and concepts or, or concepts that you all are tackling that sort of cross borders. And we've talked about stormwater, and we've talked about public safety, and we've talked about transportation. And tonight, uh, Catherine Whitesell and Fraser Picard are going to talk to us about um, what we're calling building smarter connections, but uh, regional broadband and, and some other items. Uh, and then Richard Broad's going to come back up. And um, another, I think, a good story for us regionally has been SIPSA. And SIPSA has certainly had its challenges over the years and uh, in many ways was uh, maybe, maybe built on a flawed concept uh, from the get-go. But I think... A lot of heavy lifting um, by Richard and, and uh, John Kiefer, who's your representative uh, on, on uh, SIPSA, who's now the chair. And I think there's some good 
Uh, some good things have happened there. I just want to make sure council understands and, and the community understands where we are. And then Kyle Spencer with the uh, Resilience Office is going to talk about some new sensor technology and some really interesting things that uh, he's doing with the um, Department of Homeland Security and Norfolk's role in that and, and really starting to uh, that uh, continue this idea of the smart city. And he'll make that presentation for us and then we'll go into closed session. Okay, I've got three or four items for you in close. So with that, I'd ask uh, Bobby Tahan, who is uh, um, with us this evening, to talk about uh, the item on your agenda uh, next week relative to transit-oriented development. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, there is an item that's coming forward that uh, came from the Planning Commission uh, for a text amendment to the transit-oriented development uh, regulations in the zoning ordinance. We'll be reviewing and uh, voting on this at the uh, next City Council public hearing. Uh, so just to, for a quick overview, just kind of going over the, the purpose of the Transit-Oriented Development Zoning District. Uh, it is in, to encourage uh, uses, different uses, higher intensity uses within half mile of the light rail stations and to provide kind of support for those areas. Uh, there are two districts. Uh, one is the TOD core, which is within a quarter mile of the light rail stations, and the other uh, one is the TOD support, which is from that quarter mile to half mile distance away from the light rail station. Um, in 1990, then in 2011, we created these districts to align with the uh, new light rail stations and the light rail system, and they were essentially floating districts. Uh, it was in place in case anyone wanted to add, do a different type of development near or around the light rail stations. And currently, right now, there are, uh, this zoning classification is not on the ground yet, so no property has this zoning district on it yet. Mayor, City Council, City Manager, I am standing before you to present the 2019 Annual Audit Plan. <coughs> Kim will forward it if you like. Yes, yeah, she can forward it. <laughs> First, um, the agenda, we have, we'll present the purpose of the Annual Audit Plan, our current organizational chart, the development, how we come about developing the audit plan, audit phases, the 2018 CARE 4 audits in progress, the list of 2019 proposed audits and other projects that our office um, performed throughout the year. First, the purpose of the annual audit plan, it establishes the framework for the audits to be conducted. It guides our audit activities and workflow of the city auditor's office, and it outlines area of audit focus for the next 12-month period. I, um, when I took position as interim, I did a little restructuring so we can be a little more efficient, efficient in how we uh, approach our projects because we have the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline, and we have audit services. So what I did, I divided the staff between audit services and investigative services. And as you can see on the organizational chart, you, I have a deputy over each service and two auditors assigned to each deputy. Right now, the special review person that position is vacant, but that person will be assigned um, directly to me. In order to develop the audit plan, we use several sources. We use audit leads, and these audit leads come from prior audits, investigation, inquiries, complaints, or the city financial audit. And then we use, also we use um, internal sources, the city auditor staff. Um, we're gonna do uh, internal, risk, internal control risk assessment. We also use external source citizens, current events, trends, other localities, state and federal audits that were conducted that may, um, we may have some of the same concerns or issues, hotline complaints, city council priorities, uh, specific requests, management concerns such as city administration, city de departments, and city agencies. In order to conduct an audit, we have several phases in accordance to the government auditing standards. 
we have a planning phase and those these are the events that occur during the planning phase we have an interest conference we cook the walkthroughs of the process we hold interviews and we establish our test objectives once we establish our text object test test objectives we move to the field work phase which is detailed testing we gather evidence evaluate the evidence and develop our audit findings once we develop our audit findings we move to the reporting phase where we issue a draft report to the um, auditee and we request management responses we have an exit conference where we discuss the management responses and then we issue the final report so that um, brings me to the FY18 care for the artists in progress. I discussed the phases so you'll understand where we are as we care for these artists from last fiscal year. We had the fleet maintenance contract audit. We are in the final report phase and we have our exit conference scheduled to discuss the management responses. We're, in, we're um, still conducting the audit of public Libraries, we're in the draft report phase. The auditor is working on the draft report. It has re been reviewed by managed by the deputy and waiting on my review, and then we issue it to management. Citywide maintenance, we still in field work phase, still doing some detailed testing in that area. And uh, community block development grant, we're in the planning phase because we just got started on that. Other projects that um, we do in our office of course we manage and administer the fraud waste and abuse hotline we administer the external audit contract where this is new for us but we're gonna um, administer the health care claims contingency audit citywide internal control assessment the missing losses stolen property database and we're gonna do review of disbursements credit card transactions management or any special request by management or council cash counts and other city agency requests all right so sir let's get started this evening council if we could with the project partnership agreement in our army corps project i'm going to call up kyle spencer yeah. kyle we'll get the ball rolling and then bring up our army corps subject matter experts as well all right thank, thank you dr filer uh good evening mayor vice mayor members of council uh appreciate the opportunity to get get this out in front of you one more time here before we ask you uh, to vote at the next council meeting um, on March 14th so as dr. Fowler mentioned uh, with me today from the core to help field questions and things like that I've got uh, Kristen major who's the program manager for the project as well as Mike Darrow it's probably a familiar face he's he's been with the core for a long time um, and is the head of the uh, of the civilian side at the district um, and so what we're going to try to cover tonight uh, is just a, again an overview and timeline of the of the program um, kind of where we're at at the, at the current status and uh, a little more background similar to what we covered in the retreat uh, as far as with the PPA uh, will we'll break break out some of the cost elements as well as um, um, some of the things that are eligible and non eligible so we're just all clear about that and a couple of uh, risks that we'll, we'll be tracking and keeping in mind along the way, um, and then just sort of the next steps from there. So again, we've divided the city uh, citywide protection system into four major phases uh, with a non-structural program that will kind of run concurrently amongst the structural phases. Um, just to kind of take you really quickly through these, um, we're gonna dive into phase one a little bit more, but phase one, of course, is uh, the system that runs from where the Ohio Creek project is finishing up at Campus Stella Bridge and working our way. Uh, but phase one, of course, is uh, the system that runs from where the Ohio Creek project is finishing up at Campus Stella Bridge and working our way uh, initially up to uh, the Town Point Park. We'll hop over the Berkeley, uh, the existing flood wall, and then work our way uh, across the Hague and around to Lambert's Point. Phase two will be a surge barrier at Pretty Lake with some flanking walls on the sides uh, phase three is a large surge barrier at the Lafayette River and phase four is another uh, decent sized surge barrier across the mouth of the of Broad Creek and, and again where the hatching is on the map is where um, non-structural uh, implementations will be taking place and those are 
uh, home raises, basement fills, and sometimes a combination of both. Um, as part of our work with the core, we've uh, all but eliminated, we, we think we've eliminated all the, any buyouts or anything that was originally identified in the feasibility study. So we're trying to keep it to just those types of elements in the non-structural. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about some of that detail in just a second. Looking at the timeline again, uh, it's about 10 years is our, is our goal here. Um, so we're getting uh, started. We've changed this graphic to show just calendar years to make it a little more simple. Uh, before we were showing federal fiscal years and, and it just kind of confused things. Uh, so basically, we'll, we'll be wrapping up design by the end of this calendar year with phase 1A. It will begin construction soon thereafter. Uh, the construction, as a reminder, is all that contracting is done by the uh, Army Corps Norfolk District. And then as that goes into construction, we'll kind of hop into phase 1B, begin the detailed design of that, of that piece of the project with a, an anticipated start date later into 2026 to avoid any um, impacts to Sail 250 and other festival events for that season. Um, and then we're going to uh, work our way from uh, the existing uh, downtown flood wall, uh, westernmost end, and, and work our way around to Lambert's Point from there. And then uh, we're going to, again, just stagger the, the initial phases uh, from there to the, uh, the other phases, two, three, and four. Um, Phase two will kind of run concurrently a little bit with uh, uh, some of the early phase ones, at least the design will. And then as you can see, we're going to run the, uh, the non-structural program um, as, a, as a continuous kind of program, but however, we're going to break out a pilot of about 80 homes where we want to get a nice uh, sample of, of slab on grade, uh, crawl space, historic homes, different, different types of uh, home raises that we'll need to tackle as part of the entire project and work out all those kinks in, in the pilot and then, and then come up with a game plan for the, for the rest of the thousand structures uh, that, are, that are totaling uh, for the um, non-structural program. So just zooming in on phase one a little bit more, so everything in the orange is protected by the system. Uh, it's, a, it's a watershed approach. So. So um, everything north of this kind of orange uh, map here is the Lafayette surge barrier. Um, and again, we're going to work, work into the detailed design. We're wrapping that up. We're about 65% coming up in March, uh, and then that'll get uh, finished up this year and hopefully start construction as early as possible in 2024. Um, we're going to have a system of flood walls and gates and things. I'm going to hop into a zoom in. You guys have seen this map a couple of times, but phase 1A is a system of walls and gates at the, at the road crossings, um, as well as two pump stations there at Newton's Creek, and this will support the drainage basin that is part of the St. Paul's redevelopment and the Blue Greenway. And then we will have um, a, a, another series of walls uh, over the, in, in the casino parcel uh, that will transition to a levee or berm along the waterfront um, on the other side of Harbor Park with another pump station kind of in between the berm and the flood wall where those two intersect um, to drain the, the areas uh, kind of west and north of the ball stadium. And then I want you to understand you don't have to read all of all through this there are people who want to read through it um, but the most important thing that I need for people to understand is that this jargon is used for a reason and essentially what happens is they share liability of their risk with people who are willing to contract to do the individual pieces of this work and hope that when they're held accountable you will fight against the people who are trying to make the necessary changes for us to be safe, healthy, and happy to try to protect yourself versus fighting against them for causing the problems in the first place.
I'm well. How are you this morning? I'm doing okay. That's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And um, thank you again for being so persistent in trying to reach me. I really appreciate that a lot. It's been hard to get in touch with people who are able to answer the questions I have. So, uh-huh. so again, I just thank you. Sure. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Well, really primarily what I'm interested in, Kyle, because I've been doing a lot of additional research since I um, originally emailed you, is just trying to understand how the volunteer remediation program is supposed to work relative to um, hazardous site evaluation and cleanup and uh-huh. and how, you know, I don't, I, I haven't, I can't see the report or, you know, I don't know if you can forward it to me or link it to me, but I can't see the assessment that was um, submitted to city council on the 29th. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that you can explain explain it to me or give or help me to access it so I can review it myself. Well, yeah, sure. So so what, what we've done is we, we applied for a grant back in, the city did back in 2018 um, to... to to um, Department of Environmental Quality that has this brownfields program, and what they what they have you do is do a, a phase one site assessment, and if and if there um, are any uh, recognized environmental conditions, then you would go to a phase two assessment, which is you know drilling some holes in the ground and sampling the soils and taking those to a lab to analyze those to see um you know what if any types of contamination are in them and then um the results of that uh you know would would move to a um, a recommendation to either remediate the site which is uh, could be in a couple forms you can you can um uh, take the soil away from the site and put it in a special landfill uh, for those types of things, or you can cap it in place. So you can put like, uh, fresh, clean soil, um, several layers of that on top of the other soil so that it's not exposed and doesn't, um, uh, like transverse the site or leave the site. Um, and sometimes you can, you can kind of remediate on site and, and, uh, and put it back in. And so what, what we did is we covered all the parking lots in the uh, western side of Harbor Park as part of that program, and and so when you when you get a grant from DEQ, you have to uh, enroll the site uh, in the volunteer re- remediation program, and and so what what that does is basically gives you a certification at the end that that you've done all the due diligence needed on the site to. Uh, remediate the the issue and and so we were just completing that step and so what um and so it's a it's like a good thing it's it's basically saying that um um in uh that we so we basically discovered some some soils that that had um issues but they they weren't um um really really bad like in the, within the thresholds that dq and epa have they, they didn't exceed any thresholds but but there there is something there, and so what we did was had to write up a plan to say, um, you know, what what could you use those parcels for those sites, and and um, and so what DQ based on our evaluation and, and expert help from our consultants, we determined that we didn't want residential um, people living on the first floor of a building on on those sites, and so that's what we were asking council to do was give the city manager the, the permission to sign the, the certification that put those covenants on the deed. So like restricted the deed for future development. And so you can't use the groundwater, which we don't allow groundwater wells in the city anyway. Um, and you can't um, uh, have first floor uh, residential. So it would have to be like a parking garage and then you can you know have houses or, or apartments or something up above that, kind of like you would see downtown anyway. Be patient. Um, In my questioning, I'm going to help really everyone to understand what he's saying. Um, floor of a building uh, to be, um, you know, has to has to be above the the base flood elevation on a map to keep it from flooding. Um, and and then there's several feet above that, so like 
for that area of the city, you'd have to be about 13 feet off the ground anyway to build, um, the, you know, the first floor of a, of a usable space. So that, that already kind of, it all kind of aligns with our, with our zoning ordinances anyway, um, in our plans for, for extending, expanding downtown. And then the, the final covenant was saying that you couldn't, um, use any, uh, or if you move the, the dirt or the soil or do any, any activities like that, then you would have to take precautions. The workers would need to take special precautions and, um, and, and so we, uh, we have a draft plan for that, but, but basically that, that shelf, that report will kind of sit on the shelf till somebody's ready to start moving the dirt around. And when they do, um, you know, they'll have to follow that, those, um, uh, requirements that are, that are written up in that plan. It's called a soil and water management plan. And so that, that was the purpose of, of the um the council docket item the other night was just saying hey we've completed all this program we've done everything we're supposed to do um for the future of these sites and um and put those restrictions on them and we're just asking council to give him permission to sign that certificate from the state if that makes sense does that does that help clear it up yep i mean it does but i have some additional questions okay um okay so First of all, just let me just follow where you are in explaining. Uh You mentioned um, this draft plan. Is the draft plan publicly available? Uh, It it, it can be once we finish it. Yeah. So it has to just get some uh, some approvals. Everybody has to kind of agree to it. All the regulators and stuff um, at DQ and and um, and some folks here in the city. And then once once that is finished. we can uh we can make it available to you there's nothing wrong with that yeah okay and um do you you've already made the request for the city manager to sign has he and deq has already signed so has the city manager signed it um I'm, i have to check with the city manager's office on whether he signed it or not um usually you know it could take a couple of days maybe a week he was actually out of town last week That's so I, just, right. I don't i don't yeah i don't yeah. know his schedule and everything so i have to find out um who else has to, who else has to sign it after the city manager the the um i think that's it yeah it's just okay. the the state guy um and sometimes you know who signs first i can't um they, they've they already like put their names and everything on it i I don't know if the what you know the signatures are on there that's a little bit out of my purview that kind of goes through the the administrative process that we city manager normally signs things you know what i mean i'm not really involved with with this signature process that, that's um that's out of his office so i'm not sure how they do that what step, steps they go through do you do you recall whose name is on the signature form for deq who's already signed it um yeah it's probably the um the i can try to find it um because it's a different program than than the group i think that you had on the emails you know it's um, um well, that's it's the, the brownfields group so okay well i i have a list of those names um uh-huh. i researched that so i but i don't you know it does i can't tell it's they're not their names are not segregated by regions or anything it's just a list of the people who are responsible for certifying so Uh i can send that to you and i can send that to you and it might dry your memory or you can just look up go ahead and pull up the draft plan that you created and look at the signature form and then just you know you can tell me now or you can text it to me or you can email it to me so i at least have that name Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm searching through now. It may just take me a minute. No. 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 Don't. 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 Don't worry about okay. it. Because I want you to. I want you to be able to answer my questions, and I don't want you to get distracted. But uh-huh. okay. The other okay. question I have is that you mentioned that um, if there are phases, how many phases are there? What, uh, what do you mean by phases? You said that when you when you you first uh, get the application to do the assessment, that you're at yes. a phase one. And then yeah, if yeah, the phase okay. one is approved, then it goes to the next phase. So how many phases are there? Well, phase three would be the, like the final, but that's sort of like the cleanup. So that's, that could be, um, 
we don't call it like phase three, but basically phase two, the the results or the conclusions of that would tell you what the next step would be. And typically it's not another phase of exploration. I mean, I guess there could be situations like that. I've, I haven't ever run into one of those, but, but basically um, phase two would identify the steps to take to remediate the site if it's necessary, if it exceeds a threshold. Okay, I gotcha. So, I gotcha. All yeah. right. So then my next question is, um, it's environmental and it's an assessment for resiliency, which in my interpretation means how do we preserve the natural ecosystem? Because that's how you live or how people live. You know, you want to make sure that the environment oh. is healthy and safe. And that's my interpretation of environmental protection and environmental assessment. So when you okay. say that this that the process involves collecting of soils, but you yeah. didn't mention any other types of sampling, and it's a it's at Harbor Park, which is on the water, which is also an environmental area, uh-huh. is that included in in the yeah. remediation assessment? Not not just the soil, but also the air, and then the water. Is that also included? Uh, yeah, we did groundwater monitoring because it's, it's over land. So, um, so you do groundwater monitoring and soil sampling and monitoring, you know, um, and the groundwater monitors are in there for a couple of months. And then you, you know, you check on them regularly during that period and, um, take those results back to the lab and they, you know, they tell you what, what the issues were. I think the, um, um, but we don't, we don't, um, uh, there's no like uh, uh, we don't test the air. I guess you would say it's not part of the it's not part of a requirement under the Brownfields program to do air sampling. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the um, um, it's just the dirt. Yeah, it's the ground. You know now now if there are certain types of contaminations in the soil, like let's say there's a heavy petroleum presence, and when you dig that soil up, um, you may smell the the odor of the petroleum you know and that could make someone nauseous or sick or something like that and so in those cases it's sort of like in the field you you get a smell and you go hang on stop the work we need to figure out what that is um take precautionary measures right that's that's kind of how that works is my understanding um but um but not as part of the brownfields program um there's not really a requirement to sample the air so to speak Okay. Do you do sam do you do you actually do some of that sampling, Kyle? I I, I do not personally, no. Okay. I'm the chief resilience officer, so I'm I'm uh that's c- pretty far down in the weeds. We actually don't city staff don't do that anyway. We would we hire um professional um uh, consultants to the, to do that work. We contract that out. Okay. All right. Um, and then um you mentioned that the process involves drilling holes in the ground to retrieve yeah. the samples. So uh-huh. I have two questions about that. One is um, the, well, I have three questions. Let me start with the water one. And that is, is it part of the water monitoring to, because the whole thing was about flooding to monitor flood levels because the, as a citizen, my understanding is that the city was working to reduce uh, and mitigate flooding, which is, you know, a tremendous problem and or has been because we haven't had a flood yeah. flood like I was used to in a long time. So that much is taken care of for sure. But um, at least not in terms of water anyway. So I'm wondering, is there a measurement of flood levels? Like, you know, how much above um, ground level the water floods so that the EPA could then look at what is causing the flooding. Like, is it the dams um, at the various bridge sites that are not allowing water to flow back out into the ocean? You know, those kinds of questions. So is that part of the groundwater monitoring? Is or Do the monitors also check for when there's any flooding that comes up onto the land and then how high onto the land does the water, um, you know, flood that area? No, it's... It- it's not, not not quite how it works. We we do monitor water levels with tide gauges in the city. We we have those on our open data website, um, publicly available. So so 
um, and, and anybody can can look at those. But um, what what site is that? Type of, what site is that? It's, it's called uh, data.norfolk.gov. That's the web. That's the URL. Okay. All right. And that's our that's our city open data website. And you, there's lots of interesting data out there. You can check it out. Okay. Um, and one of those is the, is the tide gauges. And so the nearest tide gauge to say Harbor Park, for instance, would be um, the downtown pump station has a tide gauge on the side of it. And so that you know that's watching the water go up and down with the tides and everything. Um, but we're you know we're we're a um, they, they use the word river and creek for the names of water bodies around here, but we're a, uh, you know, a, a tidal estuary. So, so we don't have riverine type flooding, um, or anything like that. So, so when it floods, you know, uh, typically folks, when they see the flooding, um, <clears throat> that we're used to, it's coming from the water in the river rising up, like you said, um, and it kind of gets stuck in, in the bay because of the wind directions and everything. Uh, we don't have any, any dams out here. Stay awake. Just wait for my questions uh, but, but, uh, to help understand it. And the, the gates are the dams. Is, um, it's, it's a completely different, um, type of program. It doesn't, it doesn't actually really address with flooding. What we want to make sure though, is if it's flooding, um, that, um, which is kind of the cap. So like when you put soil on top of the, a bad soil, you're doing that to make sure it doesn't run away. It doesn't run off the ground. The dirty soil doesn't run back into the river. And so you kind of, you can cap it or you can haul it away, which is super expensive. Um, and so, and so that's kind of what the, sometimes they, they recommend you do that capping program, uh, to kind of create, uh, or prevent the erosion from, run off into the river that's one sort of technique for it is that um, is the is that method included in the draft plan and is that something i could could i google capping program and then get an understanding of how that works no it's not like we have a capping program in the city it's all site by site specific so so in harbor park there were some soils that we did put a cap on and then some that didn't need it. They didn't, they didn't ex, um, exceed any thresholds. Well, what does that um, mean? What, I, I, I'm um, asking about how do I, what, how do you cap soil? Like, you know, what is that? You bring in like clean soil. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. And you put it on top of the other soil, okay, like gotcha. several, several feet of it so that it, it separates it from the part somebody it. would walk on it. or interact with. Yeah. Bless, bless your heart. Okay. Um, all right. So the la- the other question I had relative to the soils is that you were assigned to work on the Harbor Park site and mm-hmm. you were drilling. You said you have to drill holes in order to uh, to pull so soil to soil. sample. And so you yeah. were drilling holes through a parking lot to sample. Mm-hmm. So how help me to understand how that works in terms of assessing the the environmental feasibility of developing an area where there is already pavement which i would assume based on your definition is a form of capping because you you cover the Mm -hmm. entire natural surface with asphalt which is also which is why i asked about whether or not you actually had done that work because it's it's toxic (laughs) <laughs> to do so i which it, i mean in and of itself it's toxic to do so which is a concern because you everybody deserves to be healthy and if you know it's going to be toxic to have to do the sampling then and i'm just you know thinking out loud here it makes absolutely no sense to me to invest time in drilling holes in a parking lot as opposed to just digging up the asphalt and removing it because you already know it's toxic and you preserve the health of the workers, the chief resilience officer, his family and all the other families who you know don't deserve to be exposed to that because there are other ways to pave that are eco-friendly that don't involve toxic chemicals. So you don't have to answer to that. I'm just speaking out loud and just showing and just sharing how I'm sort of processing this information you're giving me. And let me tell you yeah. why, Kyle, because uh, because I'm concerned. Do you live in Norfolk? Uh, no, I don't. No. Where do you no. what, what city do you live in? 
I, I live in Chesapeake okay. currently. All right. Well, Chesapeake has problems too. I've done a lot of, I've done research on all of Hampton Roads, but I have to focus on Norfolk because that's where I live. And, sure. and I'm concerned about you and your family as well. And I'm, I'm sharing that with you authentically because it's, you cannot, you cannot jurisdictionalize the environment which is why I'm so focused on the environment to address all of the other other problems that I have right now with how this how governance is happening because you cannot jurisdictionalize the environment you cannot you can on a piece of paper draw a line around a city a demographic area but you cannot do that in the water you cannot do that in the air but they exist those lines exist lines of delineation exist so anything that's happening here is is also happening in Chesapeake, although it may not be as toxic in Chesapeake at this time. And I don't know if you own your home in Chesapeake. They have a lot of really nice properties that were developed out there over the last 15 years. And I don't know if you're raising a family, but I want to ensure that your family is also protected and that you aren't exposed on going, which is why I'm so passionate and persistent about doing all this despite my own health challenges. I don't want, no one should have to suffer what I have suffered. No one should have to suffer what my husband and my children have. No one should have to. And and I will not stop until that is the case. So I'm just sharing that with you genuinely and authentically so that you understand why I'm questioning these processes and why in my in the tone of my voice, you hear such passion because I'm concerned. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about your family. I'm concerned about your children and I'm concerned about my own. And these questions are uh, these answers are really alarming (laughs) they're you know they're really alarming so the last thing that I wanted to ask about is um this uh uh measure of livable space livable space so most of the homes there there have been some homes such as my neighbor who lives across the street um at the mirror address 3543 who built his home on a property that was previously owned by my family um, back in 2018. And he has met this development requirement of 13 feet. His house is elevated above every other home on our street. My home is, is on a four foot elevation, but it's the foundation. He actually has pylon. I guess they're called pylons, but he has, you know, those thick, they look like telephone posts. So he has those huge post you know like they have on piers underneath his house to keep to have it elevated at 13 feet most of the homes that are currently in the city are on the ground and so when you say to me that you're preparing a draft plan to seal the shelf until a developer in that is ready to invest in building this casino Um, over at Harbor Park or at Military Circle, then my question is, how does that, how is the assessment and the plan at phase one? Because that's where we are. Are We're still at phase one, right? No, we, well, phase one just says, hey, there might be, uh, based on historic records and photography or other things, there could be an issue there. And then phase two is when you have to go find out if there really is an issue okay and that's why do the drilling because you don't really know that it's an you have a suspicion i guess right (laughs) but then the phase two is what is what uh um either verifies or doesn't verify the suspicion so to speak uh that based on the historic records of a of a site right each site is its own thing and so so we didn't we we actually didn't do anything on the casino site that's a that's a different part of the project or it's a different part of the um it's a different parcel boundary but but it actually i think had a phase two done in 2016 um by a different group before the office of resilience even was involved in this any of this but but sorry go ahead okay and isn't that isn't it interesting how much that sounds like what i'm doing right now i just i I was i'm smiling and kind of chuckling to myself as you're talking i was like yeah it sounds like me a different kind of assessment though because i'm drilling too um but anyway um i I really appreciate you god bless your heart so so what you're saying is that there are some areas of the city that are at phase two but this particular draft plan 
is complete. Is that phase three? Is that, well, it will be at phase three once it's been signed. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for our conversation, we could call it phase three, but we just don't use that term of art in the, in the program. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, it's, but, it, well, the draft plan will indicate, uh, indicate a phase because you use the word phase, right? Well, that it's once you get to phase two, you either remediate or you or you do further investigation, which would be a which should be called a phase three. So we're we're in remediation. So there's not really it's not really a the phasing is just I guess how they describe step one, okay. step two in the in the assessment okay. part, part of the pro- process. Yeah. All right. All right. I think I think you've answered most most of my primary questions. The only outstanding items are the names on the signature sheet, so I'm clear about who is involved awaiting the actual signature so that the draft plan is made available. I'm going to follow up and look and check into datanorfolk.gov to see what I can find that might at least begin to answer some of these questions that I have. And then, um, uh, and then I, I think that's it. I really, I think that's, I think those are the only, I think the only thing I need from you right now would be just the names on the sheet. So I understand who um, at DEQ is signing has already signed off on the draft plan that was that was that's already been completed it's just awaiting signatures yeah. at this point okay. and, and, what, I, and i don't i don't know if you finished the, your thought with the neighbor across the street so they've elevated out of the floodplain and then were you were you asking about it wasn't a question it wasn't oh, a question okay. I, it, it was just that you know how is that going to affect future development? But I believe that that instead of having you try to explain that, because that's future um, sort of uh, um, projections is mm-hmm. to w- look at the draft plan, because once I once I see how the assessment was done and then how these um, how the shelf was sealed for a future developer, then I'll have a better understanding of the way the city um, plans for these kinds of things and then that will probably if then I, it will either answer my question or will generate the questions uh, to yield the data that I need to better understand how these decisions are made and it will also help me to understand the type of developer the city would be targeting to to come in but I know that that um, there's a huge there are people here that are really hot for the idea of a casino which I strongly oppose and it's also really hard for me to understand when our our mayor is a minister, a licensed minister, and there are 290 something churches in this area, you know, why there isn't a huge level of opposition to a proposal for something like that, given um, the, gra- the data that's available about what happens in localities where um, there's a, there's, there are casinos and a high level of tourism promotion. There's, um, there's a ridiculous amount of data on what the long, you know, uh, longitudinal type of meta analysis and data analysis uh, of other localities and what happens in those particular areas when gambling becomes a huge uh, economic stream for a government. So I just. You know, the, again, I'm just thinking out loud and, and maybe also making well yeah. known what what my position will be should the city decide to try to move forward with that. But my focus really is more on why there are so there are such toxic environmental conditions that my son has COVID this morning, that his skin is um, it's almost leathery from the amount of radiation exposure he's had. And we all experience significant respiratory problems. My daughter has been hospitalized twice for issues with her colon because of which I suspect is due to some problems with the water. I can't get anyone from who are responsible for doing the kind of monitoring and protection of the environment that they are paid to do to even come to my home to test the water. But I've submitted pictures of what my humidifier um uh, the reservoir in my humidifier looks like as it's processing the water that comes from my, not even my tap anymore. I use the filter from my refrigerator. Um, but I refuse to stop drinking the water, Kyle, because the only way I'm ever going to be able to understand and help people to get out of this 
is to experience it and to try to analyze it and to understand the ramifications myself. Um, and then to, because no one can tell me that I'm not sick or I'm not, you know, that I'm not having these problems. And so if they cannot tell me why then, and they will not explain the toxic air and water conditions, then I have to look at those people within those departments and ask what in the hell is all this tax money paying you for? Because I'm sick. I mean, there's, you can't deny that. There's no, you, uh-huh. and no medical official will tell you that that's the lie. So I'm, exp- I will not, re- I, I will continue to drink the water until the water is clean. If it, if I have to drag myself into an office sick to be able to have the questions answered, then it will just give me more motivation to ask the right kinds of questions to gather the data that I need. So that is why I, you know, re- wanted to talk with you. Resilience, the word in and of itself, um, concerns me. I know that you are newly the chief. You're the third chief since 2018, which is also concerning. When you have positions with high turnover, you have to ask yourself what is happening that people do not stay in those positions. Are they being discharged, which we know didn't happen with Doug Beaver because he's still there. But, you know, were they discharged for incompetence or, you know, were they moved somewhere else because they did a good job? And I don't know the answer to that question, but I want you to be successful as the person in charge of resiliency in the city where I live. I want you to be a stellar representative of what resiliency is for everyone in the city, in the in the Hampton Roads area, in the region to see that this guy really gets it. Of, of the three that we've had since 2018, this guy has really made changes that has improved the quality of life of the citizens in Norfolk where he doesn't even live. And I think that that, you know, that's a, a noteworthy goal for me to have for you. It's my own. You don't have to accept it. But I want you to be successful because I want my city to be resilient. I want my kids and my family to be resilient. And I want to be resilient. So if I want those things for myself, it makes sense that I should want that for you, too. And that is what resiliency is, that you are successful in what it is you are striving to achieve. And if if you continue to help me, you will do that. Yeah, I well, just to give you a a little maybe peace of mind i've been in the uh the deputy resilience officer for the like the last four and a half five years so i've i've been the common denominator in the department uh, it's a very small department we're only about six people um and um and we you know we're managing uh the two largest projects in the city um most of them around flood control so we're Uh, We have a resilience strategy, three goals, coastal community of the future, deconcentrating poverty and strengthening neighborhoods and and um, uh, and and strengthening the economy um, so that's not so tied around the Department of Defense and the work that, you know, with all the military around here. And so we work on what we call resilience innovation. Um, So um, so that's that's the that's sort of our high level mission and that's where our focus is mainly on is long term big picture kind of efforts uh we kind of inherited the brownfields program several years ago when a woman left retired from the city um but um and we actually had this grant that needed to be um executed on and so um and so that's where we went to work on getting it you know we're trying to the way i talk about it or, or look at it is Historically, cities across America have, you know, haven't done the best job of, of development and redevelopment. You know, Harbor Park um, is uh, that whole area really is all reclaimed land. So that was that was not even land in the past. It was water. And so 200 years ago, whatever, people started filling in the creeks and stuff and they didn't fill that in with an engineer fill. Um, and, um, and so, and so what, what we're trying to do is, is figure out where, you know, those issues. And so that, um, so that we, you know, where, where potential issues may, may lie in in an old 400 year old city, as you can imagine, there's a lot of potential there, uh, for issues. And so we're trying to like find those ahead of anything. And so we've been focusing on, you know, redevelopment areas, uh, efforts in the city and using this sort of state and federal funding kind of free money if you will to to um uh 
um, to go uh, understand where where issues are on city property. That's that's the the grants do require restrict us, limit us to um, to only do things on city city owned land. Uh, we can't go on private land necessarily. I mean, um, there are other programs for that, but but I mean, I didn't know if it is that the kind of thing. If you ever had out folks out there sampling the the air for you and and i mean is that um i'm just trying to think of of other tactics maybe that that could help on figure out your situation uh well the answer to that question is no that um they i mean well there have been two individuals who responded and who have come out here a couple of times and who i do believe want to help me and and i am absolutely willing to help them in their roles but they're they are restricted in their capacity to be able to do what they know needs to be done. They don't have the equipment that they need or they don't have access to it or they are not authorized to do the kind of sampling that would yield the data that's needed to resolve the issues that I'm experiencing. But I want to but I want to just make a comment to you, Kyle, because there I want to be clear that there is a distinct differentiation between the way your department has taught you to look at and to evaluate and plan for resiliency in the way that I look at and plan for resiliency. You don't need to engineer resiliency. People will thrive if they have what they need. And money, you you mentioned that the city is 400 years old. The city of Norfolk as a jurisdictional locality is 400 years old. The land here is far older than that. And the monetary system in this country is only 230 years old. So half of that time, money wasn't e- paper and coins wasn't even or bitcoins wasn't even part of resiliency. There was no money that, that, that it's on, we've only had money for 230 years. So sure. money is not what causes poverty because you cannot eat money. You cannot live in money. The only thing you can do with money is barter an actual resource with a piece of paper. It's like playing Monopoly. Like I, I make this with my time and my effort and my attention, and then I'm going to share it with you. And in exchange, you give me a piece of paper versus you made something with your time and energy or you learned how to do something because you're passionate about it and you have skills in that area. And we're going to do an exchange a, a real time exchange. So there's no debt there. There's no sort of lingering. I owe you now because, you know, because you provided me this or you gave me this. And so now I have to, at some point in the future, give you something in exchange for it. That is what creates poverty. What creates poverty, uh-huh. poverty is, is futurizing real tangible services and resources. And, you know, I always like to use the, the the trading term goods people sell and trade their good the good within them They're, that's that's what resilience is resilience is your good so you trade or you sell your good but you know the thing that you know how to do or the 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 thing you know how to build you sell it and so so now somebody owes you and the more that they owe you the more impoverished they are because they have to focus on finding a way to to, to get pieces of paper that you can't eat or wear or live in or little pieces of metal or, or little digital, you know, characters that go into a, a slot on a screen, you know, that, you know, just kind of, we're going to give you some credits. And then, and, and now I don't have what I need, but I've got all this paper and money and these little digital numbers on my screen. So I think that when resiliency is focused around e- the economy as a, consumer a, a consumable or um a commodity or a, uh, a a means of exchange of stocks or paper or you know non uh consumable products or services as a measure then we end up in situations like the one that we're in now there's you know there's no way any person who lives in, really in Hampton Road, so Chesapeake included, can go outside and say that this is a healthy environment because it isn't. You know, there shouldn't there should be zero contaminants in the water. There should be zero contaminants in the air. There should be zero contaminants in the soil, which is where our food is grown. 
that prevent the food from being as nutritious as it needs to be. And we have all of these parking lots and these buildings that are not used during a during the day or during on the weekends. Huge, tall buildings, um, big, huge parking lots. You, had, you mentioned that Harbor Park, I mean, essentially was abandoned and then it was reclaimed. So they had all that space that had not been used that people could be living in. And then you look at the conditions of the projects that are being redeveloped that really need to be torn down because they you know they have all these toxic contaminants in the building materials and we have these wonderful students over at ODU which has been classified as an R1 research university which is the highest research class of level of classification research that means we're, we're looking at problems and we're trying to come up with solutions all these amazing students over at ODU who they are funneling in or migrating into these engineering programs who have a lot of really good ideas and have them focused on engineering the wrong thing, more pollution, more toxins, um, you know, and then figuring out, well, how can we, you know, sort of dissipate the impact on the environment instead of eliminate the impact on the environment. And so, you know, I, I say all that to say that is how that is the view that I have as I look at you, Kyle, who was previously the deputy uh, deputy chief of, of resiliency under Christine Morris, who I'm assuming you're, is the, you know, you're, you mentioned as the lady who you inherited this project from, who was retired, who was only in the city for a couple of years. I mean, if she retired, she retired from being a really bad resilience person and, but not from the city because she wasn't here that long. She, you know, she sort of came in when the, the uh, I forgot, it was one of those big Carnegie Foundation or whatever, whoever did the 100 Resilient City thing, that was yeah. that was their thing. Whatever the Carnegie Foundation or Bloomfield or one of those high stock people, you know, yeah. so picked 100 cities in the country and said, we're going to, in my opinion, we're going to have a contest and see which of these cities we can run the hell into the ground and whether or not the city can you know, that particular city can build itself back up and then we're going to we're going to make bets about it and see w which city of those hundred win. That's just me. You know, that's just sort of my own little. That's how my mind thinks, because I don't you know, I don't understand because, you know, I've talked to people like you, Kyle, who have really I mean, just are in the field because they really have a passion for something. And then they get under the administrative oversight of a raggedy uh person with this title that sounds really sounds exactly like what I want to do that's exactly that's exactly what I want to do and they drag them through the most um the most uh what's the word I'm looking for the far the most far opposite polarity of their good as they possibly can until they, until they finally sort of break and say well you know what maybe I've been looking at this the wrong way no no you were looking at it the right way the whole time but they won't give you room to make the changes that you know need to be made which is really frustrating for you but you still want to raise a family and you need an income because they're all economic focused and so you you kind of have to put in there the stuff that you know should go in there where you can, but ultimately accept that they aren't going to do it the right way. So if that's the best we can do, then I mean, I have to accept that's the best we can do. But at least I know I put some of my good in there and hopefully they'll, you know, and it, it, sh it just shouldn't be that way. It, it, it shouldn't be. It, it shouldn't be. So so that, that's what I'm saying. And there I'm really the goals. Well, I won't say anything about the goals. Because those are your goals or the goal. They may not be your goals, but those are the goals of your six person department and team and you're a small department of overseers but you have an entire team of independent contractors who you oversee to do this work that you all are responsible for doing and right. and I want you to be successful in guiding them better than Christine Morris guided the office of resiliency when she came to the city and started tearing stuff up all over the place so I mean it's your choice whether or not you do that but I want you to know that as I contact you, that is my true and authentic intention. My intention is not to uh, minimize your intelligence and your expertise because I don't know. I mean, you know, you, I don't. Somebody has to answer. I don't. If I knew, then I wouldn't have to call you. So you have a level of expertise and experience that I need in order to understand better where the problems are, so that people can do what it is they were born to do, and. You know, so any passion or, you know, whatever you sense, 
I, I need for you to frame it in your own mind as she really wants to try to help me. I may not be able to do it this way, but if this will give her the information so that, you know, she, she can keep moving, then I'll, I'll give her whatever I am authorized to provide. And then I will continue to do what I need to do. But I need you to I need you to understand my motivation. And if you have any questions about that or if you simply if you really cannot, you know, provide for me something that I'm requesting, just say that. Just say I'm not because that's important for me to know, (laughs) because if you can't do it, I'm going to go to the next person. And that leaves you free of any culpability for the people who have told you that you cannot provide that information or you cannot share it. Um, But that is my motivation. I want you to be I want everyone to be successful. I want everyone to be healthy. I want everyone to be resilient. And I won't stop until that happens even if it includes eliminating a lot of people who want to be barriers to that process. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I can appreciate that. Um, did you, uh, since, since we've chatted today, did you still want to meet in person tomorrow in our office or I know you, your, your son's sick. So definitely don't, I, I don't want you to feel pressured to come in. It's totally up to you. But <laughs> no, I don't. You know, I, another time, uh, uh, to do that, though, too, as well. I would I absolutely, to- I, I cannot tell you how much it means to me to meet you face to face at least once. But okay. um, but I don't feel the need to do that tomorrow because I've, I've gathered a lot of information. Now, that, now, once I start processing our discussion today, I will need to meet with you again because there's not, I don't have all the answers I need. And you may not be the person to provide the answers yourself, but we can meet in person to have that discussion for you to tell me, okay, well, this is, that's outside of the scope of what we do in the office resilience, but this, you know, this is this, and you can, you know, you can pull it up on your computer and say, this is where, you know, the information is available. Then we invited some people from the Netherlands and really across the country and even across our region, along with Hampton, uh, the city of Hampton and Newport News. And we did, uh, we hosted a Dutch dialogue and We asked people to think through some actual projects in our city and how we might configure the city in the future to um, be able to handle the water. And so they came to us and they said, well, listen, if you want to know a little bit about your future, you probably need to know a little bit about your past. And so they got us to bring out some real old maps and take a look at them. And they said, "Uh, look, if you look at where you flooded in the past uh, and you look where you're flooding now, you're gonna see that where you filled is where you flood. So that was an aha moment for a lot of people. Then we invited some people from the Netherlands and really across the country.